Uh, Jeremy, I also want to ask you about Edward Snowden. Uh, six months ago, Glenn Greenwald uh, published his first piece about Snowden's NSA leaks in The Guardian newspaper. I want to turn to a clip of Alan Rusbridger, editor of The Guardian newspaper, who appeared before a British parliamentary hearing on Tuesday to face questions on the publication of material leaked by Snowden. Committee Chair Keith Vaz uh, asked Rusbridger about how much of the material The Guardian has chosen to publish so far. On the question of facts, you said in your written evidence to this committee very clearly that in respect to the information that you have got uh, from Mr. Snowden, you've only published 1% of the information that you uh, were given. Is that still correct? Uh, it's, a, it's approximately correct. So we, we have, I mean, we continue to publish stuff, but it's about 1% of what we were given. As far as I can see, um, you've had 58,000 files, so you're telling this committee that only 1% of the information in those files has now gone public. Yes. Later in the hearing, Alan Rusbridger elaborated on the standards he used when deciding how much of Snowden's leaked material to publish. It's harm versus good. It's authority. Uh, it's proportionality. Uh, you know, 1%, one, 1%, one not all of it, uh, and it's no fishing expeditions. And one of the things I said to the reporters right at the beginning of this is we're not going to use this as a brand tub for stories. There is stuff in there about Iraq, Afghanistan, we're not even going to look at it. That's not what Edward Snowden was doing when he wanted journalists, responsible journalists, to go through this material. Jeremy, your uh, your response to the Russ Bridger testimony. Yeah, I, I was I actually was just in London meeting with Alan and um, you know the other editors at the Guardian, and you know th there there is a war on journalism right now, and in in some countries like Mexico, it comes in the form of journalists being assassinated on an almost weekly basis by narco cartels or people that have links to the Mexican security forces. In Somalia, journalists are killed, being killed in record numbers. Uh, there are a couple of dozen journalists missing right now in Syria. And then in Western societies, um, you have, on the one hand, uh, President Obama saying that his administration is going to be the most transparent in history and that they want to be friends with the, with the press. And on the other hand, uh, they are monitoring the metadata of journalists. They are seizing phone records. Uh, they're trying to compel journalists to testify against their sources. They're trying to figure out who journalists um, are talking to within government so that they can go and indict those people. Uh, that's what they did to the Associated Press. Uh, they went after the aggressive team there, uh, Adam Goldman and Matt Apuzo and Kim Dozier and others, who were investigating the CIA. And they went to try to figure out who was talking to them. And then it re resulted in the indictment of a, I, b I believe he was a senior FBI official. Um, they will go after the whistleblowers who are providing independent information to journalists and, uh, and then leak their own information that makes them look noble and, and, and like they're winning the day for peace, freedom, and democracy. They were a total sieve in the aftermath of the bin Laden raid, and everything they said was, total, was a total lie, basically, that bin Laden had grabbed a wife and put her in, in, in front of him and, you know, all of these things. So we're seeing this intensification of a war against journalists and journalism. There is no First Amendment in, uh, in Britain. Um, and I think that, you know, seeing people like Carl Bernstein and others stand up and defend uh, The Guardian here is great. Um, but we also have, we have a First Amendment here. Um, our profession, our trade is the only one specifically cited in the Constitution for a reason. When all three branches of the government are colluding against the interests of the people, it's the responsibility of journalists and, and journalism at large to hold them accountable. But this, this White House, like Bush before, Bush's before, they seem to want only state media. They want everything to look like MSNBC. And, and that's not real journalism. So, Jeremy, uh, you, together with Glenn Greenwald, who's left The Guardian, uh, and Pierre Omidyar, the founder of eBay, are starting And Laura new, Poitras. And Laura yeah. Poitras, of course, who um, oh, was uh, key with Glenn in releasing all the, the leaks from Edward Snowden and filmed that first interview. You're starting this new news organization. Um, what are you doing? What's it going to be called? And <laughs> Alan Rusbridger yeah. said um, they've perhaps released 1 percent of the information that Snowden got. Will you be releasing more of that? Yeah. I mean, well, first of all, just to answer your initial question, um, you know, Pierre, Laura, Glenn and I started having a series of conversations, communications uh, several months ago. Uh, Glenn and Laura and I were already talking about creating some kind of a, of a news site that we were going to use not necessarily to replace what we do in our normal journalistic lives, but an additional outlet. And we were going to do a Kickstarter campaign, basically beg for money, and maybe try to hire one or two young journalists who would work with us on it. And at that sort of moment, I was in Rio discussing this with Glenn, and, um, and, and then we get this email. 
uh, from a mutual friend of Glenn's and uh, Pierre's, basically saying that Pierre, you know, is, is is working on starting this new news organization and wants to talk to you about possibly contributing. Uh, and that sort of kicked off this process then, where it was clear that Pierre's goal with this, which was to build an, a news organization that would have a an inherently adversarial posture toward the state and those in power, um, was in line with what we wanted to do. And um, you know, I, I, in a million years, if you had told me a year ago, oh, you'll be working on a project with the founder of eBay, I would have, I, I think, I would have laughed because it it it, it, it wouldn't it would it would be sort of antithetical to everything I think would happen, um, and yet he has made clear um, that he wants this to be a journalist led organization, and there's going to be resources to do long-form investigative reporting, as well as rapid response um, analysis. Uh, there's going to be a video division um, that Laura Poitras is largely coordinating right now, so we want to have video journalism on, on the site. Um, and we also are hiring a team of very savvy um, in information security people who are going to build tools for whistleblowers um, and are going to protect the integrity of the site and the communications of journalists. So um, b basically, this is an attempt to confront, initially now in the United States, uh, the government's attempt to quash the First Amendment and the Fourth Amendment uh, to the Constitution. And that's that's Pierre's major goal with this organization, and it's in line with what Glenn and I uh, and Laura believe journalism should be about. And and his uh, uh, the evolution in his thinking that got him to the point where he wanted to create this kind of a news organization, does he give you any sense of how that developed? Well, you know, he um, he started um, uh, a site called Civic Beat. He lives in Hawaii um, and and helped to found the Huffington Post site that's uh, in Hawaii and has has dabbled in other media ventures. And before you know, we started working, I talked to people who worked with him, and it, I mean, it really sounds like he is an effective. Uh, he's a very effective leader um, in the in ventures that he sets out to to create. Um, and my understanding is that the, he was so deeply offended by the extent of the surveillance um, that the NSA is doing on pr primarily Americans, is, was his concern, uh, that it started him thinking that he wanted to do something much bigger than just a regional site, that he actually wanted to go for it and, and build a major news organization. You know, that he had looked at, I think, buying the Washington Post. He said that publicly in an interview. Um, and my understanding is that he, he wanted to be able to start something fresh and to work with a team of people who aren't necessarily tainted by having been a part of a big bureaucracy, and then someone else comes in, like Jeff Bezos, who, you know, the Amazon guy, bought the Washington Post. Um, and I, th I don't think he wanted to, to do that. He didn't want to be sort of a conqueror. He wanted to be building something new. Jeremy, uh, before, well, when is it launching? Uh, early next year. I mean, we're still working out the details on that. Before um, we go, uh, you're leaving for Geneva tonight. Explain why. Yeah, I'm going there um, to uh, honor the Yemeni journalist Abdel El Haider Shaya, who was imprisoned for three years after he exposed a U.S. cruise missile attack uh, in Yemen, and he was interviewing leaders of Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. He was his home was raided. He was arrested by Yemen security forces, put on trial for being an Al Qaeda collaborator, which was a complete farce, uh, and then he was sentenced to five years in prison. He was supposed to be released um, at one point, and then President Obama personally called the white, called the dictator of Yemen. And and told him, uh, we don't want him released. And then he ripped up this pardon of him. So Iona Craig, the great girl from Times London, I will be in Geneva honoring him because he's not allowed to have a passport. He is under a default form of house arrest. And he believes firmly that it is uh, President Obama and the White House that are responsible for the conditions of his release from prison. He's now been out of prison for two months, but he is still not free. And so we are going to represent him at a I'm human fine. rights awards ceremony because he can't be there because of President Obama and the White House. Jeremy Scale, we want to thank you so much for being with us. And again, congratulations on Dirty Wars being shortlisted for an Oscar. That